No matter how much knowledge may be provided about the thought process behind a creator's passion project, someone will just respond indifferently to his or her words, due to not caring about the work itself. But I'm willing to believe that at least a fair portion of Ruby's fanbase do care about what its creator, Montiel, had to say, and do not mean any ill will when making claims about his intentions without attaining the proper knowledge. At the very least, it's easy to see how much he and his talents and accomplishments were admired. It's also easy to see how much the untimely passing of someone who is deeply idolized can invoke lots of sorrowful, fretful feelings swirling deep inside. If a fan got attached to an ongoing project that idol worked on, and he or she found out that it would continue at the hands of other people said fan knew much less about, then being concerned about how that project will turn out may potentially lead to weathered expectations. As hyperbolic as this may sound, those people taking over might as well have to prove themselves for the remainder of their livelihoods, with their backs perpetually against the wall, being told constantly to not screw things up. And that's precisely the burden Miles Luna and Carrie Sharkers had to bear. Ruby Volume 3 was the scariest thing ever. Um, Monty was gone. And that changed everything. At that point, we were even more sure that people cared about these characters and stories. What we weren't sure of was if they were going to stick around. We had to grow up real fast. And that is such a thematic coincidence because that was the exact same thing that happened to our characters in Volume 3. Miles and Carrie are not Monty. They don't share the same exact interests as he did. And even if they do, their experiences consuming those interests won't ever be fully replicated. Despite Carrie in particular having worked closely with Monty as co-writer and co-director in Volumes 1 and 2, Carrie's workflow isn't the same as Monty's. He certainly didn't spend whole nights isolated with his eyes glued to multiple monitors and his fingers attached to a keyboard working on action sequences by himself the way Monty did. For many that mostly, if not exclusively, cared about the fight choreography the way Monty did them, that may come off as a train wreck waiting to happen. But it's important to bear in mind what has been uttered so far about this project. There is a lot more to what Monty wanted out of this web series than just fights and the sense of rule of cool that happened to rope in the audience it did. And to say that Carrie, who would be the main director of Ruby to this day, and Miles, who would stick around as co-writer, didn't know this and wouldn't try their damnness to do anything about it, would be selling both of them utterly short. As understandable as it is for fans to picture such a scenario where different people in charge could stray from the original creator's vision due to other known projects being met with a similar issue, the circumstances of Volume 3's production would not quite fit that mold. Miles and Carrie having been recruited in this project from the very get-go is undoubtedly the biggest reason as to why. But like with what concepts Monty wanted out of the show, and how the assortment of other people were assembled into working on the web series, we can dig deeper into what ways Miles and Carrie attempted to maintain that very vision. Let's look at what even happened in Volume 3 story-wise. It had the fall of Beacon, Penny being dismembered, Tortric's death, Pyrrha's death, Velvet's weapon reveal, Weiss tapping into her summoning ability, Blake and Adam crossing paths, Ironwood revealing his metal half, the introduction of Crow, of Winter, of Taiyang, of Salem, and a multitude of fights within a tournament that had been built up in the main story since the middle of Volume 1. In Part 1, where I talked about the timeline of the show's early stages of development, I referred a bit to the open letter from that one former animator. Also mentioned in that document was how certain ideas for fights and moments were removed or changed. While one can look at what ideas were supposedly stripped from Volume 3's original outline in a vacuum, looking at the bigger picture is what really matters. By considering all that was kept in the main narrative for Volume 3, which was only allowed 12 episodes to work with, it would have been inevitable that certain other ideas needed to be taken out due to either episode count, scheduling, or whatever other complications in the production. 
The third installment in a currently ongoing web series was definitely strenuous on much of the staff involved behind the scenes, given a rather large scale of the volume story. Much can be said about Rooster Teeth Animation's production management practices over the years, but that doesn't automatically mean said practices were a result of ill intent on Kirin Miles' end, as if they're mustache twirling villains wanting to sabotage a dead man's vision from afar. Oh man, <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't end up getting to make it just uh, due to production stuff. Like, we had to cut uh, a fair amount of stuff this season. Um, but one of the things that we didn't have time to do, we actually had a, for lack of a better phrase, Super Saiyan version of Nora. Nice. Where whenever she gets electrocuted, it's like, you know when you have like, you're carrying a bunch of static electricity and your hair kind of stands up? Yep. We wanted to make her hair like extra spiky and like oh, a little glowy. So we, we didn't have to have time. We did not end up having time to do it, but. I think actually, you know, just going back to weaving in stories, the the hardest thing to work with this year is a lot. Originally, we wanted to do a lot more with Raven's story and Yang, um, but it was just one of those things where we only had so many episodes. Yeah, Raven, Raven's a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we're not going to get into it because we want to actually show the story in the show. But I mean, it was it was something that we knew a lot of audience members wanted. But it was just that was like the one thing that's like we're not going to get to this this year. Um, but we wanted to definitely set it up for future seasons. Mm -hmm. Volume 3 was not the end-all be-all installment in the main narrative, not by a long shot. Whatever aspects that were not left intact for one volume can be preserved and arranged for a later point. This is essentially what happened with Adam and Yang's fight, Raven's character having a more prominent appearance, and John blaming himself over Pyrrha. All of these are cases of what Carrie phrased multiple times as making a push rather than a cut. And he wasn't the only one to have expressed a similar sentiment when it came to taking out originally intended ideas planned for a given volume. Has there ever been any fight scenes that you just don't feel come together and that you just, you know, let's scrap this, let's reshoot it? If something is not coming together, you know, I, I keep my edit open and I look at it in, in, in its wide format and say, how does it fit within the episode? Is it telling the proper story? Am I getting the point across? If it's not, I start making cuts. I have some fight scenes where it's, it's good storytelling, but it might not be good storytelling right now. But I really want this for the two characters. I want Blake and Yang to do something together to show them as a cohesive unit. I'm like, I'll do this now, but I have more for it later. I'm, it might be la later might be episode 12. Later might be two years from now. I mean... But this has been constant. There have always been circumstances of ideas for characters, Grimm, and moments that had to be taken out for narrative reasons and then be preserved for a later point. It didn't matter if this happened as late as Volume 6 or as early as Volume 1, such as the Emerald Forest Trials. Dude, the, oh god man, I can't tell you how many revisions the monster fight scene in the Emerald Forest went through. We wanted to establish early on that they can grow to be outrageously huge sizes. So we see the Borbatus in in uh, seven uh, chapter six, um, and then we in this initial fight scene we were going to have a giant Borbatus, a giant Nevermore, a giant Deathstalker, and then another creature of Grim that uh, we did not end up showing in this volume. Um, and so four four monsters. Uh, the Petra Gygus was originally intended to premiere in Ruby Volume One yeah. during the Emerald Forest Trials. It was essentially uh, it was supposed to be a three way fight. Actually, no, it was a four way fight because there was it was a giant Borbatusk, yes, a Petra Gygus, a giant Nevermore, and a giant Death Stalker, and that was supposed to be a, the fight. Though as much as they tried to rearrange certain moments, there was one rare instance where Carrie and Miles unfavorably had to make a cut during Volume Three's production. Something not even mentioned in the open letter, but rather both on their interview with AfterBuzz TV and in the director's audio commentary track of the Volume 3 Blu-ray and DVD sets. Uh, there's actually another fight originally in Chapter 5. In the doubles rounds. During the oh, doubles mm. rounds. It was Sun and Neptune versus Pyrrha and Nora. And that was, without question, one of the most painful things to have to do. Yeah. Oh. It, it really came down to the fact that um, the, the fight had absolutely no relevance to the plot at all. Yeah. And we were already like, we went over our page count on oh, just wow. about every episode. And it's like, I mean, the last episode is what, 28 minutes, right? Something insane. Well, with all the, yeah. with all the yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah. But, but still, it's like, um, and that's great. And it's amazing that we were able to do that and yeah. that we were able to have that. It almost killed our team. Yeah, if we if we um, hadn't cut that fight, we would have missed our deadline. The, 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 yeah. the finale wouldn't have been anywhere yeah. as, it would have been nowhere near as close to as good as it, as, as it turned out. Yeah. Um. So we just, yeah. had to bite the bullet and cut that fight. Um, and yeah. one of the biomes that you're currently seeing behind Penny that we never Suffer. had to use, the anti-grav biome, 
We um, were so excited for this fight. We, we it was really, gonna be so much fun. It was very comedic heavy. It was it was it was a very comedy fight, and we really just wanted to have two main teams fight each other. We thought yeah. that'd be really interesting. We were really trying to have as mo as much fun with these characters as possible before things got real yeah. know, by the end of it. It didn't even hit the boarding phase, did it? Oh, no, it did. Oh, it did. That's yeah. the sad thing about it. Then maybe someday we'll Joe, have to show that. Joe did a really good job. He boarded that fight, and he did a really good job playing <sighs> with the anti-grav. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. the thing that I was I was most broken up about that we lost was um, we wanted to have a, a payoff for um, Neptune's Sphere Water Eagle. Try to put that anecdote in perspective. Harry Shawcross, as a director, made the decision to save the fully presented version of Gang vs. Adam's conflict for a later time, while having to put a different scenario that featured a character he voices that could have led the small growth for said character on the chopping block. Conversely, in the same audio commentary, Flint and Neon of Team Funky, a team that Monty, Patrick Rodriguez, and animator Austin Hardwick talked about one night back during the development of Volume 1, was officially added into the show. And going back to the Four Maidens, which, again, was thought of by Monty when outlining Volume 3's story, was added and expanded to the point where the full story of the Maidens in the World of Remnant was meant to be the version Pyrrha explained to Ozpin in Chapter 6. The only reason that did not happen was because the script was too long to fit into the episode proper. A rough transition period behind the scenes at Rooster Teeth Animation after Monty's passing was inevitable, and not all ideas for Volume 3 were guaranteed to be left intact. But it cannot be understated how much Monty Elm already entrusted Miles and Carrie to flesh out his ideas from the beginning. In one of his journal entries entitled Ruby Questions, Ruby Answers, Monty addressed the matter of who had been writing the main story. I am, but I don't have time to write everything and Miles and I had a good thing going with RVB-10. Plus, he's way better than me. So we were finishing RVB-10, I would give Miles and Carrie the lowdown on who my characters were, what my world was, the story I wanted to tell, and they were able to expand on that as well as add to it. Much similar to Bernie, I come up with the large strokes my specific scenes, then they do all the heavy lifting. With the process of cultivating Ruby's interpretive world, Monty may have been the one to come up with the basis of Remnant's geography and culture, but he did at the end of the day collaborate with Miles and Carrie on specifying all the parts of it. This was made clear in something like the board game Team Ruby was playing in Volume 2, that snuck in little tidbits about the Four Kingdoms before any of the World of Remnant minisodes got around to explaining anything. In fact, on his most off days, Monty relied on Miles and Carrie to help jog his memory on certain terms within the world. Uh, Haven Academy, Mistral, Beacon Academy, uh, uh, Vale, uh, Atlas, talk about some other time. Then we haven't really talked about the school at, uh, at Vacuo, but we will Not in yet. time. Was it? <laughs> no, okay. What was it? Money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... Oh. oh, it's so hot. Oh, wait, it's not hot anymore. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> the three of them had collaborated so deeply during Ruby's first couple of years that even after Monty's death, it became evident how much the culture of the people residing in various kingdoms would be presented. Where Volume 1 only went as far as peppering in a few names of locations like Atlas, Mistral, and Sanctum, and Volume 2 merely showed the school uniforms of each academy within each kingdom, or lack thereof in Bakio's case, Volume 3 introduced several teams wearing combat outfits that either strongly hinted at or raised questions about the kingdoms they resided from. The Bions in a Vital Festival tournament also added to the intrigue about what the different places outside of Vale could be like, such as the kingdom Sun Wukong grew up in. Alright, home field advantage! Don't get too cocky, that's my surf too! On a narrative level, Miles and Carrie left implications of what would be the next destination for the main cast outside of Beacon, by having some characters name drop certain locations like Mistral and Haven in Volume 3, setting up the trajectory for future plot points. And Volume 4 onward would of course show the actual different locations throughout the world of Remnant one way or another. When it came to the Eastern Asian inspired towns, Kuroyuri and Oniuri, they gave insight into the character Lai Ren and his childhood who prior to venturing with Ruby, John, and Nora to Haven was one of the more relatively quiet supporting characters. With what was seen of Atlas and the Shni Mansion, a more vivid picture is depicted as to why Weiss emitted enough frustration towards her father and the upper-class society she grew up in to have wanted her enroll in Beacon Academy. 
Oscar Pine, having lived his young life on a farm in the rural parts of Anima for as long as he remembered, naturally yearned for more out of his life, even if he had no way of knowing what that quote-unquote more would entail. Similarly, Ruby had never explored that far beyond her own home and patch, so certain destinations she sets foot in fill her with a sense of excitement. And unlike Yang, who has her motorbike and adventurous attitude to help her casually travel to wherever she wants to go, Ruby underestimates the challenge of trekking to another kingdom for the first time. These examples are all manifestations of the geography determining the culture, the people within said culture, and the stories formed from said people that Monty talked about. And this sense of thought into the narrative still applies after each passing volume. In the case of the city of Argus, environment designer Weston T. Jones, who was brought on during Volume 6, described that the location's aesthetic to be a fusion of San Francisco and Greco-Roman architecture. Some fans picked up on the former aspect immediately by looking at the hills and trolleys. However, the latter is especially noteworthy, since Argus was home to a specific academy that a specific beloved character attended before enrolling in Beacon. Though for all the amount of thought applied to Ruby's overall setting, whenever discussions about the show's flaws take place, one of the most recurring sticking points is the very matter of Ruby's worldbuilding. Some have argued that the world is underdeveloped, or that the elements of high fantasy are inconsistently presented. Usually the way the main cast was kept in the same household and haven for whole chapters, and the explanation of Aura are go-to examples critics refer to. This is all really deviating into a whole different, more broader topic about the role and level of importance worldbuilding has in storytelling, of which I have my own personal opinions on the matter. However, one of the most extreme claims I've seen uttered by critics is how the world not being presented to their liking is a result of Miles and Carrie making things up as they go along. While one could argue that not every minute detail about the world of Remnant was set in stone from the get-go, that doesn't mean nothing was thought through. All the additives of Ruby's world may have not been fully established by the time Monty, Carrie, and Miles finalized the script for Volume 1, but the foundation of said world, consisting of the history, the mythology, the geography, and the culture provided were already there. Anyone can tell that much if they spend enough time observing Miles and Carrie talk about this stuff. It's one thing to be disappointed and have gripes with the world building as it has been currently depicted. But to conclude that it was all created on the fly, or had no sense of thought, would be factually inaccurate. Not only do Miles and Carrie have more than a full grasp of the aspects of Ruby's world at this point, but the way it has been shown in relation to the main cast after the fall of Beacon has more or less aligned with where Monty wanted things to go, according to an interview on the Tune and Talk podcast. I'm a big Final Fantasy fan, so like, Final Fantasy has, to me has always had this like, magic tech. Where it's, it's both magic and technology. Where you have you have airships and you have cars and buildings and planes, but you also have this giant world. And my, you know, my favorite moment in Final Fantasy VII is like this is my first Final Fantasy. You're in this city and it's this like steampunk looking city, and then you get to the world and it's this giant green field. And the contrast to me was so great. It made me want to, as a 14 year old, be like, I want to go on an adventure. You know, <laughs> the world is similar to me, where it's like we're centralized in this one country right now. And uh, they're, they're, they're studying at the school, but eventually they're going to go out and journey into the world. The world itself is a world where it's similarly populated by monsters. So if you wander the plains, you may get attacked. And you may have to, like, you know, you may you may be pitching a tent one day or sleeping in a hotel the next day. And someday they, they, could, they might get an airship or they might get on a boat. Various things. It's, uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's essentially, uh, essentially like a type of journey which, which I'd like to tell. Since that's all just world building though, what about the idea of making Ruby an anime, another staple within Monty's vision for his show? In part 2, where I talked about the creative process, I elaborated that certain anime titles had varied influences on the show, while certain others would have more of one down the line into Ruby's production. One such title was the TV series version of Black Rock Shooter, where Monty once tweeted back in April 2012 about how the show implemented 3D and 2D theories he had also been working on. During the anime's production, Studio Ordet had animated all the 2D scenes, while Studio Sanjigen handled all the 3D ones. 
On Sajigen Zen, they had actually used the industry standard animation software tools from the company Autodesk, those being Maya and 3ds Max, the latter of which featured a plug-in tool pencil that can render models to effectively emulate the shaded aesthetic commonly seen in 2D anime. These same exact softwares have been used in Ruby since Volume 4, and Kerry Shawcross expressed how what was utilized in Blackrock Shoes production served for what he and Monty supposedly wanted out of the show sometime in the far future. You know, up, up until this year, we were animating the show in, in Poser, and this is the year that we made the jump to both Maya and 3DS Max at the same time. Um, you know, g going into Volume 4, we decided, you know, yes, we were going to move to Maya. Um, there's, there's a multitude of reasons, the biggest just being it's slightly more of an industry standard, meaning it's easier to get people to work on it's it. It's scalable. It's, it's scalable. Yeah, for, for a bigger production. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, and both bigger production and bigger scenes, I mean, there were sets in Volume 3 that had to be pared down because there were literally too many um, polys in it. Like, we, we were starting to reach the point where the, the, the software was just crashing. Um, so then I threw a wrench at that and said, hey, if we're already moving to Maya, and we're already going to be going through hell. There's this thing There's this plugin Pencil. that we've been wanting to use for years called Pencil in 3ds Max um, that we originally saw in uh, shows like Black Rock Shooter. Um, again, you know, pre-Ruby, um, when when Monty was just touring out the idea of wanting to do this anime style. Um, and we thought, one day we'll use that, maybe. There's a whole lot more that goes into what shapes Ruby's aesthetic beyond just the technology. But the takeaway is that Black Rock Shooter did at least have an influence on it. Another anime that would be influential to Ruby in recent volumes, whether this was intended from the beginning or not, was of Hunter x Hunter. Both the 1999 and 2011 versions, Monte had watched in some capacity. We said from the very beginning this is an ensemble cast. Um, obviously, Ruby bearing the namesake tends to, you know, occupy the main character slot a lot and a lot of times essentially what that means is she is helping other people uh and and helping them with their problems yeah um, a lot of a lot of inspiration for ruby came from Gong from hunter x hunter mm -hmm. who's like he may not necessarily always be at the forefront of everything but he is like the connecting tissue for a lot of the character stories and is able to support them right between Soul Eater school setting, Gurren Lagann's theme of driving perseverance, the ensemble-style storytelling between the main protagonist and the supporting cast in Hunter x Hunter, the utilization of technology in Giant Robo, the mixture of 2D and 3D techniques to create Black Rock Shooter's aesthetic, and some of the story structure and possibly tone in Avatar Less Airbender, these titles have served as large inspirations for molding Ruby into the type of story it would be. This passion for the medium and drawing ideas from different works into Ruby extends beyond just Miles and Carrie. Though. As most members of the crew who come on board for each volume are anime fans themselves, and have used certain anime titles as inspirations for what make up different parts of the show. Two of the visual effects artists, Jeff Yon and Quentin Holtz, studied effects of wind, fire, water, smoke, and explosions seen in various anime for Volume 5. This even extends to Nora having her own custom, pink-colored, two-shaded smoke for her grenade launcher by the time of the train sequence in the Volume 6 premiere. To put this in perspective, effects are among several things those in the Sakaka community, anime fans with an avid interest about anime production and the numerous skilled people involved in them, would obsess over when learning about the styles of any individual animators who are or have worked on their favorite anime titles. There are also storyboard artists and camera layout artists like Rachel Dota, a diehard fan of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, likes to study cinematography in her spare time from some anime like The Big O. Supposedly, according to the modeling team in RTX Austin 2018, when making the various ingredients for the ramen hot pot dish in Chapter 7 of Volume 8, they aim to make it look as comparatively delicious as the kind of food seen in Studio Ghibli films, something that had never been successfully done in the show before until then. Do you have anything with the low salt? Ah! Most of Ruby's animators are also big anime fans themselves, one of which being Austin Hardway, who had been involved with the show throughout the first five volumes. Whenever he animated the character Penny, he used Gon's super-powered naive nature from Hunter x Hunter as a basis, and was of course pleased when he found that Megumi Han, the seiyuu that voiced Gon in the 2011 Hunter x Hunter version, would voice Penny in Ruby's Japanese dub. 
Kim Newman, another animator that was brought on since Volume 3, mentioned that her passion for wanting to do fight animation started with the boxing anime Hajime no Ippo, which, yet again, Monty was a fan of as well. Sometimes the wink and nudge to certain anime can be seen in Ruby's opening themes. It's currently not confirmed who provided the storyboards for the Volume 6 intro, but certain shots and transitions feel strikingly similar to that of the second Soul Eater opening. None of this is even referring to Ruby Chibi, which, well, does that even need to be elaborated? To even try to argue that Ruby no longer follows the very thing about the show that ignited Monty's desire to make it, that being to make an anime, would be blatantly false at this point. The Kruby have remained quite passionate with some anime title on the brain when crafting on the web series, whether it's individual people within different departments, or the collective group as a whole. Some of the most brief of references can be seen all over the show by comparing any individual shot or sequence to whatever other work side by side, regardless of what volume it may be. Banzai! Banzai! Whatever examples of such sequential nods that have been done in Ruby had similarly been handled in other anime-inspired works, like Teen Titans and the Boondocks. Even something completely disassociated from emulating the look and feel of anime, like Bob's Burgers, is guilty of doing the same thing. This is weird, right? This hasn't stopped critics in the past from harshly judging Ruby for having winked and nudged the anime tiles as heavily as it has been though, even when Monty was alive, with a few going as far as accusing the staff of plagiarism. There is certainly a worthwhile discussion to be had somewhere about the matter of when tributes and homages can actually be taken too far. But considering that even various anime titles have presented similar references to older, more iconic ones to varying degrees, why should Ruby be crucified just for doing the same thing? This is obviously becoming too deep of a rabbit hole to dive into for this video. So I would advise watching Kirby Ferguson's Everything is a Remix Remastered video, as well as the Cartoon Cyphers video on Netflix's Castlevania and Why Anime is Not a Brand for more insight on that exact subject matter, with links in the description below. Going back to Monty's vision, as much as inspirations from certain anime and fleshing out the world of Remnant have been consciously utilized to this day, not everything about Ruby's production is guaranteed to be completely maintained after his passing. As stated in Part 2, Monty expressed wanting to balance between deliberation and spontaneity at the start of Ruby's production, with the character Neo being created the way she was as a prime example of this. But considering that the number of people involved in the show has only increased exponentially over the years, to make sure every member of every department is on the same page from sequence to sequence, making impulsive decisions is not something one can easily get away with within every volume's production. Proper planning and communication would have to remain a priority going forward. Improvised ideas have never ceased entirely though, it's just that as the story further develops, key characters and events from the pre-volume 1 days are now being added one by one into each new volume's script. Those broader macro aspects may need to be finalized by the scripting phase, but the more micro aspects, the one applied in a given sequence, are more likely to be improvised by various people, depending on the stage of production. Every single episode, at least something happens at once, where I, you know, either Miles or I wrote the scene, we think we know exactly what it's going to be, and then um, somewhere between boards and, I mean, even all the way through audio and um, uh, post and, like, you know, comp, like, things can change and things do change. Referring to Rachel Dota again, for instance, she occasionally made additions into her storyboards for certain scenes in Volume 4. One instance was adding an insignia of Pyrrha's crown on John's new shield in Chapter 1, while another was to frame Crow being surrounded by the campfire as he explained his semblance in chapter 8. We, uh, the shot uh, inside the fire See, was definitely one of those shots that uh, Rachel had the idea to do it while we were boarding Rachel Dota. And uh, I told her, absolutely draw that. I, I make no promises that that's going to make it all the way through. Um, but every, 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 you know, every next department after that, I explained the shot. I was like, no, we should do that. Um, so, you know, every, it was one of those things where it's like, it was just such a beautiful shot that everybody wanted to make it happen and everyone out of their way to make it happen. The moment where Sienna Khan, in her dying breath, struggled to reach for Adam with ferocity wasn't even in the original storyboards. Rather, it was something added by animator Aisha Bishi, 
who was another fan of the show before being brought on during Volume 4's production. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. We <sighs> haven't seen, like, a killing straight up person on person like that, except for, you know, Pyrrha and all that. This is definitely That's probably been, the first most graphic. One. Yeah, mm -hmm. just straight up. I love up. this where Because you linger on her face. It's, yes, and this little, yeah. she's like angry. And that's that was added. Like that was not in the boards yeah. and Asia added that little detail. Yeah, really you can crazy. tell when Asia just geeks out on her shots. And contrary to what has been argued by many critics, Carrie was hardly ever draconian towards animators regarding action scenes. It's true that he and Miles would outline the play-by-play -play of the fight in the scripts, and had meetings with the storyboard artists and lead or assistant lead animators. But outside of communicating who would work on what scene, the animators assigned were given a fair bit of creative freedom. You know, this fight is a, this fight is a really good example of how like, we started with storyboards, and it kind of grew from there. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to look to storyboards now and the finished scene, Penny. it's it's way different. It's it's very different in a lot of ways. It's also similar in a lot of ways too, like True. the. The overall, um, like the path that they take through the courtyard, mm -hmm. is actually pretty similar. But but yeah, you know, Joel and Ian were, did a really great job of like, okay, we want them to get from A to B from here. We suggested something, and then they go, okay, what if we did this and then this though? And then that kind of like it kept escalating. Like I remember when they showed it to us, or well, at least me for the first time, and there was an added like minute and twenty <laughs> seconds mm -hmm. to it, and we're like, oh wow, we just added a minute and twenty seconds <laughs> extra to the fight. That, be that became Joel's thing, isn't it? Yeah. He touched, just added a minute. <laughs> so many of <laughs> Dylan did that with the Nevermore and Ten, yeah. just like, yeah, hey, uh, I know we only needed this, but I made a thing without asking anybody. Do you want it? And the answer is like, always yes. I mean, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Speaking of action sequences. Since Volume 4, and to a lesser extent since Volume 3, the presentation of fights have looked a questionable, if not outright poor impression on many fans. Some were so bothered about it that one in particular directly asked Harry Sharker about the matter. In Volume 4, the fights had a lot of the more Hollywood-style cinematography where you're cutting a lot between the hits and the impacts. And I was wondering what the reasoning behind that was, rather than for going for a more Hong Kong Kung Fu movie styled cinematography. Because the Hollywood one, from my understanding, is because you have actors that don't know how to fight, but I would assume, and I might be wrong, that Ruby doesn't really have that problem. Eventually, people no longer question the idea, and just assume that Carrie leaned towards a quote-unquote Hollywood style, and Monty leaned towards a quote-unquote Kung Fu style, was common knowledge. But the reality of this claim not only oversimplifies how Carrie approaches fights, but even how Monty approached them as well. On October 25th, 2011, Monty posted a journal entry on his DeviantArt page, where he explained the thought process behind animating the highway chase scene in episode 17 of Red vs. Blue season 9, which had the longest uncut action sequence he ever did. I've always felt whenever movies do what's called a long take, that the action itself kind of suffers due to the simple reason of being safe and lacking the polish of editorial. Particulars come to mind, like Hard Boiled or Tom Young Goon, so I was like, why not? I have the advantage of editorial despite living in the realm of action choreography. It being animation, why not do a long take? Let's extract that last sentence and compare it to the answer Carrie gave to that one fan from the RTX 2017 Ruby panel. I think that's just um, a, you know a style thing like early on that the Monty adapted to is just you know the, the limitations that you know live action shoots or like Hollywood shoots have you know they were there were limitations and it was ways to get around thing but I think it also bred a style um, and I think that that's something that uh, you know he enjoyed and I think that's one of the big things too is you know we're an animation company you know we, we work on animation but I think we're a lot of us are also inspired by, you know, live action or, you know, a million different other things. It's one of those things where I don't think one thing, one way to do it is right or wrong. I think using them together, which is something we can do in animation, allows us to find the flow that we want to. It's not as if Monty's approach to making action sequences between his Red vs. Blue days and his time making Ruby have changed that drastically, as he strongly utilized recycled bank animation from his older works. So to believe that the medium of animation allowed for flexibility on fighting different sources of inspiration probably never changed either. And with working on Ruby, he drew inspiration from various works beyond just the martial arts movie genre. One occasion, he suggested that animator Dustin Matthews use Superboy and Black Canary's sparring match in Young Justice for Pierre and John's sparring session as a frame of reference. Then in another, he was deeply inspired by Peter Jackson's The Hobbit films of all things. 
I saw the Hobbit and I was like, those dwarves are on point. They know what each other are doing. We need to do cool stuff like that. Where like, <laughs> I remember watching the Hobbit, both the first one and the second one, the way they, they try to showcase how like they have this subconscious communication. And I want wanted Team Ruby to have some of that where like, you know, as a team, they, they like know they're like ahead, they're, they're one step behind each other. Everyone's opinions on fight scenes in Ruby or any other work of fiction that features a large quantity of them will vary from person to person, with at least some undoubtedly playing the role of the professor in a given conversation. However, what determines the quality of fights in later volumes of Ruby on a case-by-case -case basis could arguably have less to do with preferences for style or control over the animators and carry on Miles' part, and more to do with sheer differences in experience between them and Monty. That doesn't change the fact that the former two also pulled from varied sources, some from anime, some from live action films, and some from video games. I remember I'd come up with the idea for the, the scythe part of it a while ago, but then you had the idea to, of how she uses her dust. Yeah, it was uh, definitely some inspiration from playing the reboot of God of War <laughs> and just how satisfying um, what? the axe is in that game. Yeah. Uh, but this idea of, okay, well, what if you were to take that and then combine it with a little bit of Marvel's Thor and take into consideration, like, you know, Ruby uses her heavy scythe to kind of throw herself around. Maria is also kind of light. She can use her size to kind of pull herself around, or if she's fixed to something, pull that something closer to her other scythe. And it really just it made for a super fun, like, all over the place fight. Regardless of how one feels about whatever action scenes within the show, one thing is clear. When it came to how they approached drawing ideas for fights in the medium of animation, Harry, Miles, and Monty were all on the same wavelength. Though arguably one of, if not the biggest components of Monty's vision that sadly has been neglected and dismissed by most of the fan base, yet ironically carried on by the core staff, are the narrative themes. As stated before, Miles and Carrie are not Monty, and thus don't share the same connections Monty had with, say, the cosplayers he knew personally when it came to shaping the characters. That's not to say they couldn't use their own experiences or other outside ones when writing whole scenes for later volumes. This was a fun scene. This actually, the idea of what kind of word are you just came from a fun conversation I had with some friends one day. We were like, ooh, what kind of word, what kind of word is this person or that person? It's like the idea for it, it was just a fun conversation I'd had with some friends that was an entertaining way to like, like there's something fun about finding the perfect word, I think. And I, I felt like it was really fitting for Blake, who really enjoys reading and literature and stuff like that. As a, a I imagine it as like a fun game she probably used to play when she was a child. This is this is, this scene was actually um, kind of inspired about. Uh, um, this is something happened to me is when my uh, when my grandfather on my mom's side passed away. Um, so we're you know our family was together a little bit more than usual, and it was the first time I'd ever seen my mom, my dad, and my grandmother uh, from that same side. It was the first time they ever actually treated me like an adult and not like a kid. Um, I, I, I guess just at a certain point I was like, well, he made it through that now. Um, but they were telling stories and, and they'd all gotten a little tipsy. Mm. And it was just like, it was just really, I'll never forget that moment just because it was, it was the first time that, you know, I, I felt like they thought of me as close to a peer as possible, I guess. They're actually talking to me like they would talk to one of their friends. Mm. So I, I think we just try to channel some of that through there as you know. As much as Ty wants to hold on to his baby daughter, that's not what she is anymore. The beginning of this scene uh, drew inspiration from like uh, interactions I'd had with my family before. Like, I have when I would, when I would have friends over sometimes, uh, particularly when I was in college. A lot of times, my parents, particularly my dad, would always be like, would always go to my friends and be like, "Okay, this one doesn't tell me a ton of stories from college. What's what's been going on? What crazy parties you've been going to?" And always wanting to get more of the full story from my friends. And then uh, with Gira, you can tell they, they just want to talk, but they're not entirely sure how. I don't know, I remember like when I was younger, I would say that my dad and I never got along, like I love my dad, um, but we just didn't have a ton in common when I was younger. And I remember there were so many times like, where I just didn't know how to talk to my dad about something just cause I was, I, you just, yeah, where no. do you start? Even without taking personal experiences into account, they do understand the outlines for the main characters and their stories far more than fans are willing to give them credit for. In the Ruby panel at RTX 2013, Monty was very clear about connecting the members of Team Ruby to that of their respective voice actors based on his own impressions of them. And it is those very impressions that would be applied directly to the characters and be carried on over to where the story currently is. I, I draw a lot from reality. The resonance of this show will find its place in reality because if you uh, 
if you understand struggles of what it means to be growing up, which I think all of you are, grown-ups or growing up, then you'll understand the characters. And there's truth to a lot of the characters, and it even makes its way into even their abilities. For example, I won't go into it too much, but if you dissect a little bit about the Yellow Trailer, for example, there's parts of it that were inspired off of uh, working with Barbara and talk, knowing her for the last three or so years. And I suppose we'll get into further down and it'll probably make itself clear, but uh, things based on feet of strength, which is something I find uh, inspirational about Barbara. She's uh, both strong and vulnerable. You both act like the easiest way to tackle an obstacle is through it. That strength is all that matters in the fight. But if you just take a second look, then maybe you see there's a way around as well. I've stared death in the face over and over again, and every time I've spat in that face and survived because I'm strong enough to do what others won't. Oh, shut up! You don't know the first thing about strength. You turn your back on people. You run away when things get too hard. You put others in harm's way instead of yourself. Might be powerful, but that doesn't make you strong. Who do you think you are lecturing me? Standing there shaking like a scared little girl. Yeah. I'm scared, but I'm still standing here. Monty's means of unveiling beneath the superficial traits of the core cast have also continued past the fall of Beacon, with characters like Weiss being a prime example of this. I remember back in Volume 3 when we introduced Winter, people were confused because they had always assumed that Weiss was an only child. You know, her, her song in the white trailer is about being alone. She right. talks about being alone, wanting bunk beds, all these things. When we meet Winter, we see, okay, she's a little cold and standoffish. Okay, I can see that. But she also... Weiss seems to still like her. Yeah, but Weiss seems to still like her. So then we introduce Whitley. It's like, okay, well, what's ha what's going on with this guy? Starting trying to lay the foundation of like, yeah, she had a brother. They never got along. Mm -hmm. And we see as the season develops that that relationship is even worse than the initial thought yeah winter's never around you don't see her mom at all this volume do you wonder why yeah. um, even though weiss comes from busy family you can still very much be alone at home and i think that's something that's particularly tragic about weiss's backstory even little aesthetic details directly tied to the history of specific characters were kept in mind as the story developed but it does motivate a lot of things and it's funny it's another serendipitous thing uh you're not going to remember this anyways because it will come like years from now. And it's based on like some really unique circumstance. I came up with a character that's a certain character's mother. I came up with a character that's a certain character's father. And via design, it determined their eye color. And it was like, well, I've got a 15, 17 year history of a character that may or may not still exist that we'll discover much farther down the line. Do we ever talk about, uh, this is such like a random one-off thing how Ty and Raven's eye color affect Yang. No. Did we ever talk about that? No, I don't think we did. This is just one of those things that Monty wanted to do that I think it's just, I just again, it's a testament to like, we just like goofy things sometimes, or we just like things that maybe don't make sense, but they make sense in a different way, where uh, we knew, you know, right from the get-go, Yang's eyes were purple. And then uh, as we were designing Raven, they were red. So then we started talking about Ty, he's like, well, he's got blue eyes then. That just makes sense. We were like, why does that make sense? Yeah, he's like, well, red and blue make purple. And we went, <laughs> You know what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's do right. that. Yeah. Let's do that. And while the main protagonists were given the most thorough treatment with their individual stories, the antagonists were not exempt from this either. It's like such a truly black and white story about good and evil and stuff. But we have a current set of bad guys, and as they appear, they have motivations that make them antagonists. It's something we're, we're hoping to discover as the story goes along. Uh, currently, they're set up that they want to cause the chaos and anarchy, and they want to topple. Uh, certain people that are in charge. Uh, a lot of it's a mystery, mostly because we're like with the with the journey we want to take with these characters and the, and the bad uh, the bad guys that are meant to complement them. We're figuring out where we need to go with them as well. What's probably the most telling indication of how Miles and Carrie do care to carry the vision of their late colleague and friend on a narrative level has to do with something I referred to in the part two video. In it, I quoted what Monty said from the Volume 1 Blu-ray behind the scenes feature about the importance of people having a path towards becoming who they are, even when marginalized with reality. As much as fans and critics alike love to stress on how many initially got into the web series for, say, the fight choreography, it really bears repeating that there's more to Ruby than that. It's more than just an elongated, glorified reel of fight sequences featuring badass characters. It's also a story with specific themes meant to span across a series of volumes, and Monty, Carrie, and Miles were collectively determined to convey that. 
Experiencing hardships that come with growing up and discovering oneself are things Montague had been outspoken about in the past, such as on Twitter, and they have been manifested more and more into Ruby's story. If Volume 3 was about showing how sometimes bad things, even devastating things, just happen when you least expect it, then Volume 4 onward is about how the main characters choose to respond to more of them, and to learn how others prior to their time have coped with their respective turmoils. With the characters being constantly put in positions of having to figure out what they want to do, what they need to do, and what they can do, pursuing the path to becoming who they are as they grow has remained a very conscious component in Ruby's narrative, and I doubt we'll see the end of that anytime soon. Obviously with fictitious media, everyone will have their biases towards certain characters and against others due to a combination of personality traits, behavioral traits, voice casting, backstories, and actions. By now, everyone who has watched enough of Ruby will have their minds made up about the cast, positive or negative. And once that happens, not much else can be done on the writer and director's end other than to stay true to the path of the story set up for these characters. But make no mistake, whatever ways the characters are currently being depicted, however people feel about them, they are simply on par with Monty having been explicit in the past on generally seeing how they all grow beyond their first impressions. The line in front of the, the, the Yang trailer, uh, people are not one-sided, uh, people are not box-shaped, is to say that we do categorize people, but I also want to give people the chance to be more than what we expect of them. So you can expect a lot of growth for these characters as they grow into the characters. Same for Aaron, I mean, I spoke about it earlier, it's like we're kind of, you know, figuring it out, but one of my least favorite things about the current trend in storytelling these days is the investment for a character needs to be right up front and I think there'd be more weight to her character if you realize you love her 20 episodes in you know and then you you know it's one of those things that's always been there and the thread for it is it's very long and has a lot more weight to it and same goes for Kara is more about just there's this weird like similar difference between the black and the white character where there there's a surface level thing and then there's a there's an inner level thing and then a lot of the motivation for Ruby herself honestly comes from the innocence. Uh, so it, it's all there, but it, it takes time to discover it, and sometimes it, it'll be up front. Yeah. If I said that Carrie Sharkars and Miles Luna get judged and verbally antagonized rather excessively, some diehard fans would find that to be the understatement of any given year. Since fully taking the mantle of creative leads and having to fill every inch of Monty's shoes, critics who have expressed dissatisfaction have often uttered phrases like, Ruby died with Monty, or Monty would have never wanted this, or Monty would be rolling in his grave, or things would have been different if Monty was still alive, etc, etc, etc. People tend to express these sentiments with great confidence, as if they painted a specific image in their minds as to what Monty himself was like, that as an artist, he didn't believe in cooperation that he wanted his vision to be fully manifested without being compromised, and how things only started to change since Volume 3 of 4, when Carrie and Miles took the helm. This has led to, not all, but much of the show's most persistent critics and pendants to rationalize whatever they believe Monty represented through the show's initial presentation, and that Carrie and Miles put together with the Boogeyman, a threat to that very representation itself. You guys are ruining my vision! <laughs> But let's back up a bit. If Monty really had everything his way in the first place, then Volume 1 alone would have possibly looked and felt like quite a different beast. Various characters would have much different designs. But yeah, this is the original drawing, and I actually, there was originally, and this is one of the things I said to Eileen, please dear God, keep, keep me away from the color black, because if I had my way, I'd make everything black. Torchric, Corsic, and Fennec would have been accomplices, and Grimm would have functioned differently. Well, yeah, they were originally in Volume yeah, 1, sure they were did. working with Roman Torchwick. That was back when, like, oof, the way the Grimm worked were super different yeah, everything in that first draft. Like, it was like this, oh, yeah, it was weird. People would, like, uh, what was it? You could, like, sell the liquid Grimm that you see yeah. at the top of Volume 4. It was weird. That was that was strange times. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Corsic and Fennec were trying to sabotage the uh, Emerald Forest trials yeah. by... Uh, buying some liquid Grimm From off of Roman Torchwick and, and combine it using some uh, creatures of Grimm that they captured yeah. to like use it to combine them to make this giant like crazy monster thing that was kind of like a T-Rex no. dragon yeah. thing. It was, it was a lot. It was, it was interesting. Was a lot. But I remember was, Monty was just like, T-Rex, let's do it. Yeah. And then a bunch of people gave us notes. We're like, all right, let's, re let's, let's maybe revisit this another time. Neptune would have not been a member of Team Sun, but a totally different group. 
Uh, well, the funny thing about Neptune is, he, remember he had originally had a different design yeah. and was on a different team, but then we moved him on the Sun Station. Oh, yeah. We were like, yeah. we were having a tough decision with that. We were like, oh, we do have this other cool team, but then again, we could use him now if we move him on the Sun's team. So we took the N from another team and put him on Sun's team. And speaking of which, Team Juniper themselves would have had a much smaller role, and even its team leader's name was not originally going to be John. It's like, yeah, but we also didn't fit. have John at the point. I had Gene. Yeah, it was Gene, <laughs> as in blue jeans, was the idea yeah. for his name. It, it, yeah, which was awesome that during a during a, one of like our writing review things, uh, Bernie came up. He was like, he was asking why he was named that, and we were like, oh, because we need like a color name. It needs to have this criteria. Of yeah, letters and colors. Yeah, so he was like, well, why not just use you know jaundice? And we're <laughs> like, oh, that's really good. Yeah, we're doing that. We should have done that from the beginning. <laughs> Let's not forget how the Emerald Forest fight with the Giant Grimm also went through its own fair share of rewrites. Hell, the span of the first major story arc would have been different, where the fall of Beacon would have happened by the second volume and not the third. It's hard to know how far we'll go with this, you know, the landscape always changes, but it's good to have an idea of where you want people to be. How long it takes you to get there is hard to tell, but you know, if we look at the past as a rough estimate, I would say I have seven seasons worth of show in my head. But you can say that with like being able to say there's a, an event in season six that I'm like, oh, I could actually just do that right now. Yeah. And um, on top of that, you also can never predict the fact that the one, two, three that exists now was originally supposed to be one, two. So some things might come sooner. Some things might get smaller. Some things might get bigger. Originally, there was going to be two volumes that made one season that was one big story arc. But we've enhanced our story arc. So volume two may not, ne may not necessarily be the end of an overall story the original arc. Plan there for, may be yeah. another volume before we get to the end of this particular story arc. I mean, I think it's good overall, not to be rigid. Yeah. I think. Yeah. You know, times change and ideas that we thought were great when we first started, like even between volumes one and two, like all of us were like, mm, that idea was okay. Let's, let's right. maybe tweak that a little yeah. bit as we go forward and mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little, and we've thrown out like, you know, different number of seasons throughout the years. That keeps changing based on, you know, our runtime keeps going up, which means we can cover more things. There's also some things that we've decided would be better for like a spinoff show or like a, you know, like an OVA kind of like mm -hmm. one-off thing or something like that. So there's a lot of stories that, and story that we want to tell. So we're just going to kind of keep going. Yeah. yeah. There likely would have even been changes within the voice cast. Considering that cosplayers like Miss Habit and Vampy Bit Me were confirmed to be a partial basis for characters like Weiss and Blake, should they have been cast as those respective characters instead of Aaron Zek and Kara Eberly? Even Monty himself would have voiced a different, more relevant character than Lai Ren if things went about the way he wanted them to. When I first approached Ruby, I mean, think about Rooster Teeth as a company back then. We were, you know, Red versus Blue, it's like, you know, Gus is Simmons, Jeff is is Griff, and it's like, you know, Bernie plays church, uh, and I, I follow Bernie as a role model, say, okay, I need to do what Bernie did, let me follow his steps, you know. I wrote a character with a lot of exposition as like the god character of the show, the guy who knows all and tells all, and it's like, the story kind of revolves around. That went out the window real fast, because I can't act. I just play the quiet guy. Right. Um, and then we casted Shannon as Ozpin, and it's like, wow, that's much better. Sometimes in interviews or other sources, authors or creators will reveal that a character in their works was somewhat based off of them. In Monty's case, the fact he originally intended to voice Ozpin implies a few things about Monty's way of seeing things. Oz has a definite method to his madness. Like a bunch of people were like, he just leaves so much up to chance. But there's, I think he kind of believes in that because, you know, the whole world is filled with people that you may or may not get along with. But whether or not you like somebody, doesn't really matter. If we don't work together, we're all kind of screwed as a people. Wait, there's a difference between chance and letting things play out. Yeah, Oz has a yeah. lot of really bizarre methodology that's, I mean, kind of inspired by the way I do things on the, you yeah. know? Yeah, you know, yeah that's definitely something we thought about was, you know, there's a centricness, I don't know, <laughs> to the way you work sometimes, and it, it works, so, you know, that's good. God. And there's, there's definitely that to Ozpin as well. Ozpin, as experienced, wise, and skilled as he was, also had his flaws. Yet, he expressed great humility and put those who served alongside him in high regard to the point where he willingly looked past the poor choices they made, phrasing them as missteps or misguidance in favor of emphasizing their achievements. If there was any truth to that supposed connection between Ozpin and Monty, then the latter in reality was hardly ever this uptight auteur that never believed in the value of collaboration and sharing his vision. 
To suggest that he actually was out loud sounds ridiculous, when taking into context that Monty wanted a story where one of the biggest ongoing themes involved characters working in groups, be it of two or four or even whole societies. You could be J.R.R. Tolkien and keep it within yourself and write it by yourself and then maybe be that lucky and, and, to find a studio that wants to... Yeah, and maybe so many years after your death, someone makes your dream movie, That's true. if they do it good enough, That's and find success when you're 80 years old or, or, or plus, or even better, the more pure artists that we admire. Yeah. Musicians who have only seen success in their works 200 years after they died. Yeah. Do you want to be that guy? We live in a much faster culture, and yes, it requires some level of, quote-unquote, selling out. I, I'd rather call it compromise. To be too much of an artist is not good for your health. Especially, I mean, in the nature of this project, I'm just selling out to other artists, and I'm letting them have it. So that's perfectly right. fine. I mean, I've always felt that my artists are far more talented than me anyways, because I don't come from a legitimate background. I'm self-taught, I cheat, and I cheat, and I do, I take as many easy advantages as possible. My team are legitimately trained animators, modelers, designers, and they do everything from a much more traditional sense. Whenever anyone insists that Montian would have never wanted this or that to happen within a show, how much of that line of thinking stems from having an in-depth understanding of him and his vision as opposed to just a vague impression? If anything, such baseless assumptions seem to be nothing more than an excuse to further vindicate whatever dissatisfactions people have with the show's direction. Since Ruby first became known to the public in late 2012, the web series has only gained abundant popularity, meaning that for every new time material, crossover, or merchandise that's sprouted, more and more people have potentially gotten into Ruby through alternative ways without any prior knowledge of Monty or Rooster Teeth. Some became intrigued with the show's existence through the Yang vs. Tifa death battle, or more recently, Weiss vs. Mitsuru. Some learn of it through the different Ruby manga installments, be it through scanlations or official releases through Viz Media. Some developed a bigger interest after learning of the truncated version of the Japanese dub from Warner Brothers anime that was legally streamed on Crunchyroll. Some even discovered the show through Team Ruby's appearance in Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle. The show's critical reception may be mixed, but it's only become more commercially successful since Monty's passing, thanks largely in part to those tie-ins. Anyone who got into the web series through any of those means or whatever other ways, their first impressions of what makes Ruby what it is are based on certain appealing factors. You have that ever-expanding crowd, and then there are those who are hooked from day one, who may have had their own nuanced reasons for why they got into the show, such as the wink and nudge references to the company that produces it. A former fan like Ember Reviews, for instance, would argue that Ruby does not exist by itself, and was from the get-go first, first and, and foremost, a Rooster Teeth show. And there's definitely a level of truth to that if one were to do a quick Google search for a compilation of easter eggs and references. The company's co-founders, its employees, and all their personalities and quirks have certainly left this lasting impression on what first embodied Rooster Teeth's supposed charm. And when taking into account the Achievement Hunter poster in Team Ruby's dorm room, the Simple Walk restaurant being a play on the Simple Walk to Mortar and miniseries, Ruby's That's My Uncle line being based on a Rooster Teeth animated adventures episode of the same name, and even Yang's rare puns, it's easy to see how from a certain perspective, the latter volumes in that sense shed away layers of that charm. I think he was some sort of cat, actually. What, like a puma? Yeah, man, there you go. Is that an actual cat? Right? What, no, it's like a shoe. A cat. But the topic of Monty's vision is not about appeal or charm. Whether one got into Ruby because of the company references, the action choreography, the rule of cool, the headbanging music, the character and weapon designs, or the tone and humor, none of those reasons diminish all the other things, the intentions, behind what Monty claimed to have wanted out of his series. When alternatively choosing to take that into account, Ruby is no more of a Rooster Teeth show than it is an anime-inspired one. And even then, the show's not aiming to apply literally every trope and concept that has ever existed in a cultural medium. A line was always meant to be drawn somewhere, and like with almost everything else uttered so far, you don't have to take my word for it, as Monty himself uttered the following in one of Crunchyroll's feature articles. For Ruby, there will be dark-skinned characters who aren't wacky loudmouths. I've done my tenure in fan service. You can only recycle something so many times before it becomes stagnant. And however one might feel about the show's current tone and direction, it's not as if Carrie and Miles suddenly abandoned the idea of referencing company anecdotes. Um, but we wanted to do something, you know, nice with the butterflies to kind of be this, you know, representation. But uh, also the the lemon tree goes back, way back to the the lemon punch that Monty did <laughs> in a, a panel that we that would be just like a 
a fun little reference. Ruby is more than a Rooster Teeth show, and it's more than an anime inspired one. It's also the embodiment of Monty's values, the effort between him and those who have collaborated with him, and the combination of ideas he had both for years prior to the series and as it developed. This web series has really managed to capture as widespread of an audience as it has over time, and that's something worth celebrating. But there's also a double-edged sword to all of this that I earnestly find troubling. Everyone is entitled to their reasons for why they got into Ruby, but it can be baffling how personal enjoyment and appeal is placed so highly for many that it overrides the willingness to be properly informed. Much of what Monty has been outspoken about seems to have been buried and forgotten. The only times where someone does care to learn more about his intentions tends to be when it's framed in a more controversial manner, like the open letter. Having read through the document several times myself over the years, I'm more certain that much of what was written is accurate based on some things Monty had expressed elsewhere prior to his death, among other bits of evidence. I do not doubt a majority of the information presented, but I do generally question the overall message it had sent. Putting aside that a couple of things still do not entirely add up, what has remained bothersome after every read-through is how the letter framed the matter of Monty's vision by presenting two sides of the fence. There were those who the former animator personally felt treasured Monty, whether they officially worked on the show's production or not, and then there was everybody else who worked at Rooster Teeth, including Miles and Carrie. One excerpt described the production of Volume 1 as being both a good thing due to objectively needing a team to get things done, and a bad thing because of how much was compromised. It expressed how Monty was frustrated in response to other people calling the shots, even though Monty himself openly explained in an interview why compromise on a creative project was necessary. The animator sincerely believed Monty's Ruby was in its pristine condition from the red trailer until the end of Volume 2. But when the original creator himself was once asked what his Ruby was? My original vision was the trailers, right? Which isn't much to say other than that, hey, let's have a lot of action and some cool girls. Like, it exceeds it in so many ways, and the things I want to do are such a, a longer investment on, like, I have this key sequence I want to do in Season 7, let's get there, and like, oh, fuck, when are we going to get there? But, you know, in the meantime, it's so much fun, the process of getting there, because I know by the time we get there, it'll be way better, because you'll actually be invested in it for the reasons you just, like, you've known these characters for this long, or, you know, much to, like, Red vs. Blue, where you're just like, I can't believe we've gotten this far. You know, we have to get there first, so we kind of take it a day at a time. I'm sure Monty has had his off days and periods of frustration during the production of Volumes 1 and 2 and outlined the story for Volume 3, as that's simply being human. But are we, the show's audience, expected to soundly believe that everything he said in his journal entries and interviews were all lies? That he fabricated how he felt about some of the people he worked with to give his fans and interviewers what he thought we all wanted to hear? Now you're catching on. So far, you've done nothing but accept what others tell you, but you need to question everything. This is why I've remained as ambivalent about the letters I have been. As credible as it is, it shouldn't be deemed as the only source of truth. What most don't seem to realize is just how much the Montion Vision subject invites talking about Ruby from the lens of authorial intent. It's totally understandable if one would rather swing the other way and abide by the whole death to the author school of thought. But there can be great value in better learning what Monty actually wanted out of Ruby that can at least theoretically lead to more thought-provoking discussions. Unfortunately though, the ones claiming that the creator is spinning in his grave over every little thing in the show really want a conversation about not facts and authorial intent, but about conspiracy theories and confirmatory biases instead. I've mentioned how in part 1 that whether anyone knew Monty own personally or not is not necessary to have a discussion about his vision, and I stand by that statement. However, what's also required is the willingness to be respectful about the subject matter. Look, if you're disappointed, even angry over how Ruby has failed to uphold your personal expectations for why it first grabbed your attention, then fine. If you feel compelled to drop the show because you can't stand where it's going, then proceed to do so. If you have this urge to make your own hobbyist fanfiction that embodies what you, one viewer, wanted out of the series, then go ahead. Ruby has its flaws, that goes without saying, and I don't expect to persuade everyone who has already made up their minds. But we don't need to resort to wild conspiracy theories, absurd baseless accusations, or just overall conjecture about the creative staff. Whatever gripes you may have with how one character uses a weapon, how another character behaves, the outcome of fights, or how the world isn't ideal enough, they're never valid excuses to be lazy by spreading misinformation about the behind the scenes. 
If we're going to keep bringing up Monty's name from here on, then we need to let go of whatever confirmation biases any of us have been holding on to. Either have the conversation with the level of gravitas it deserves, and a willingness to be better educated, or don't have it at all. And also, let's not just limit our understanding about Monty's vision to just one or two sources either. Discover as many of them as possible. Everything I've referred to across the span of these three videos, the sources that were used, can mostly be found online, and fairly easily at that. To make finding them even easier, I have been personally compiling every relevant tweet, interview, journal entry, video, and other tidbits into a single document, with a link in the description below. There's definitely a lot more that can be said about Montion, his colleagues, his creative process, and his web series that I've neglected to mention in any of my three videos, and we would be here all day if I spoke of the rest of them. But that's all the more reason to approach looking up all these sources with an open mind. At the end of the day, this video essay trilogy is meant to serve as one giant launching point to promote what I hope to be more insightful discourse and less skin of the week talk. It can be very easy for those operating in bad faith, or even in good faith, to make the conversation about something less beneficial. So to be clear, this is not about wanting criticism to go away. This is not about getting people to stick with the show. This is not about the reputation of an internet media company or its working conditions. This is not even about calling out any lone individual. No. What this is really about, what it should be about, is learning more about what a guy and the people he handpicked simply wanted to tell about a bunch of kids named after colors. This saying may be tiring to some, but the phrase, keep moving forward, could not be more relevant than right now. Montiel may be gone, but Ruby is still pressing on, with new installments into the main story. Carrie Shawcross and Miles Luna are obviously dedicated on moving forward with the narrative. But we, the show's audience, can do more to abide to that same mantra into the future of Ruby discourse. We can still talk about the main story and Monty's vision regarding it and how much of it has or has not been sustained. But from now on, if we're going to have that talk, then let's steer more into the right direction, as our way of moving forward.